Hey there, music lovers. Welcome back to another episode of AMC Presents. I'm your host, William Ford, and today we've got a real treat for you. We're sitting down with the incredibly talented composer and arranger, Matthew Sheeran. You might recognize his name from the recent release of his album, Acoustic Microtonal, brought to you by Sedil Records. But that's just scratching the surface. Matthew has been making waves in the music industry with his unique arrangements of tracks from superstars like his brother Ed Sheeran, Dua Lipa, Lizzo, KT Turnstall, and many more. But let's rewind a bit. Did you know that Matthew's journey started way back when he was a child? He was wowing audiences as a treble soloist in operas and church services. Talk about starting young. With a classical training background and a thirst for exploring music from every corner of the globe, Matthew's musical understanding knows no bounds. After honing his skills at the University of Sussex and earning a master's degree in composition from King's College London, Matthew's career skyrocketed. Over the last decade, he has racked up a collection of prestigious awards for his groundbreaking work in the industry. Today, we're diving deep in Matthew's journey. From his early encounters with classical music to his groundbreaking compositions, we'll uncover it all. But that's not the totality. We'll also be delving into the nitty-gritty of preserving music in the digital age, and of course, discussing Matthew's mastery in arranging music for films and TV. And we'll be exploring the fascinating world of microtonal music. Ever heard of composer Easley Blackwood? Well, Matthew's going to give us a glimpse into this man's genius and walk us through the intricate process of arranging Blackwood's electronic compositions for acoustical instrumentation. At the end of our tour, we'll get to explore the magic firsthand. We'll compare Blackwood's original microtonal etudes performed by synthesizer with Matthew's breathtaking acoustic arrangements. Trust me, you won't want to miss it. So grab your headphones and get ready to be blown away by the incredible talent of Matthew Sheeran. Let's dive in. Hi, how are you, William? I'm good. Good to meet you. Good to meet you too. Where are you? I'm in Bath in um, in uh, the UK, near Bristol, Cardiff. I presume you're in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, actually outside of Atlanta. Where exactly did you grow up? Um, I was born in Yorkshire, which is in the north of England. I was born in Halifax, uh, so near Leeds and Manchester. And I lived there until I was six. Um, the uh, I, I lived in a town called Hebden Bridge, where the uh, TV series Happy Valley is set. I uh, don't know if you know that. Um, and then my family moved to Suffolk, uh, which is where my grandparents live uh, lived. So my grandmother was a, a singer, so she sung for uh, Benjamin Britten and Stravinsky and Vaughan Williams, you know, these these types of people. And um, th she, they lived in Aubra, uh, where Bre Benjamin Britten uh, lived. So uh, Benjamin Britten was a very big part of my um, upbringing. There was a lot of money from his royalties funding uh, sort of community music, so I and sung in the church choir from the age of six for my brother. And um, I was in several Britain operas, such as Noise Flood, uh, where I pay, played Shem. Um, and so uh, mu music was always there, but uh, I never sort of considered it as um, something to do as a career until much later on. Um, I, I played violin as well. Um, my grandmother played violin as well as singing and she gave me her um, her violin. Oh. For you, classical music was pretty much there as early as you can remember. I think so. I mean, there was oh, there was also pop music. So when we we would drive around, we 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 had quite long journeys uh, in the car. So that that was mainly pop music because it's hard to hear quiet pop, uh, classical music in the car. So it's mainly pop music so there's a song by Kate Bush called Wuthering Heights um, and, and Wuthering Heights is, is it Emily Bronte she was from um, Yorkshire I think um, so it sort of fitted in with the kind of all sort of vibe there um, and so we listened to 
think Janacek, uh, the possibly intimate letters, the string quartet. I, I remember hearing that a lot. Can't remember that there would have been other pieces, but I, I I'm not sure what they would have been. Um, classical music in the form of um, um, I remember seeing Peter and the Wolf one Christmas when I was about five. Um, that was really great on TV. Um, there was also Fantasia, which I saw, which was also really great. Also the the Disney films and very high quality uh, music orchestrations, etc. When then did you decide music was probably right for you? Because obviously you went into advanced studies. So when I was about 14, I, I became very um, obsessed with um, uh, virtuoso violin music by composers such as Paganini and Wieniawski and Ernst and Isai. And I started writing some pieces in the style of those composers just for fun as a hobby. And in my town, there was a child prodigy who who I knew who was home educated, and um, uh, but she uh, she um, was in the orchestra at school, like she was the leader and the youngest person there, that type of sort of situation. And she, I, I think, I showed her uh, my compositions, and she 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 said, you know, this is actually something you can study, um, something you you know do do as a career potentially, and she. Um, suggested that I audition to, to get composition lessons at the Junior Guild Hall um, in London, which I did. And, and I, I got in, which was really great because I, I wasn't, you know, you know, this was sort of impossible. Violin music was all I all I had to show for myself. And and there I was taught um, very important basics of notation. And th there were opportunities to write for um, real musicians and many sort of it was sort of the school of hard knocks when you start off you know people play your music really badly because uh, they're sort of not being paid so they they don't make a big effort and from that you learn you learn many things but it's it's quite sort of uh disconcerting but um it's an important uh important part of the process um yeah and then i then i um applied to, uh, for a university to study uh, music but with a focus on the composition so I chose Sussex University which had a strong composition department and I was able to get violin lessons at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama there as well I wasn't very good and I wouldn't have got into the Guildhall School of Music and Drama as a violinist but I could get lessons there via the university through the performance module so that even though that would have my mark, my my overall grade would be lower because I did performance. So I could have done something else and got better marks. I thought it was very important to continue playing and learning about performance because obviously that information's important for composition as well. And I don't regret it at all. Did your peers have a sense of you being interested in music? And if so, how'd they react to it? Yeah, I think so. I, I remember we had we had a sort of prom uh, when I was 16 uh, with various awards and things. And I think I got most likely to have a one hit wonder, which I thought was really strange at the time. But now I probably have that. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. And your parents, they were totally supportive of going in. Yeah, they, 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 they were very supportive. I think that that's probably the most important thing possible is to have parents that are supportive of what you want to do rather than what they want you to do or um, something else. Um, I think that's very sort of underappreciated in the education system is that it's really the parents that are the sort of key to a lot of um, uh, success. But you were a singer also. I was a singer until my voice broke um, and then I stopped singing. But I, I was I was quite good, but I wasn't encouraged to sing during the uh, period when my voice broke because of potential damage or so. So I never I never took it. Out. I I I did do some singing later, but not not seriously. Were you better than your brother? I I was until I my voice broke. Um, I think he was more shy than I was. Um, um, and now I'm more shy than he is. <laughs> His line of work, it's probably not a great thing to be too shy. He he was a uh, um, more guitar to begin with, and then uh, through a lot of experience, the 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 singing got very very good. And now he's probably, you know, more not better known as a singer than as a guitarist. But in those days, it was he was better known as a really really good guitar player. Um, Did you 
two have a good relationship, a typical brother brother relationship, or yeah, I think a typical brother brother relationship. I wasn't interested in what he was doing really. Um, I don't think he was interested in what I was doing. Um, he's interested in lyrics. I'm not interested in lyrics. So, you know, a lot of jazz standards, they have really stupid lyrics, but I really like the melodies and things, but that wouldn't be something that he would sort of ap appreciate as much, et cetera, et cetera. But over time, we've become more similar, um, for sure. And you do arrangements for some of his songs. Yeah, if... Yeah, yeah. Um, if he asked me to do an arrangement, I'll, I'll do a, an arrangement. There's been other people have done I've done arrangements for him as well. So I don't do I don't arrange all of his songs, but um, whenever whenever he he feels that I'm the right person, then I'll, I'll go happy to do it. And and um, very easy because I know the sort of things that he likes and doesn't like. You didn't feel that you were a very successful violinist. No, I, 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 as I said, I only became sort of passionate about music seriously when I was fourteen, and that's that's just a bit too late to be to become, you know, very very good. Do you have any of the compositions you wrote as a kid, still? So, uh, what's interesting? This is something that uh, I think about a lot. Is um, the the music software of that time. You can't um, open the files anymore. Uh, but I printed out a lot of my music, so it's it's all preserved in printed music. And I think this is something people need to worry about: is that you know things like YouTube videos, sheet music, etc. You need to have it physically out off the internet somewhere to be sure that it's going to survive. Um, like if there's uh, a war. Or, some sort of war the data centers might get bombed or so you, you never know what's going to happen uh, a lot of um if you look at silent films so many silent films have been lost um the wizard of oz music is gone that they um the uh, studio thought it was taking up too much space so they they destroyed it there, there's no copy of the wizard of oz music no, they're not even talking about the original score i'm talking about the actual any of it so um so yeah, this is. I'm I'm glad that I. Uh, I mean, this the music when I, I wrote when I was um, you know, a teenager isn't uh, great stuff, but uh, it's it's nice to have have copies of it still. Uh, I did notice there was a comment on one of your YouTube videos by someone lamenting the fact that there wouldn't be hard copies. Yeah, of the CD. Yeah, of your music in general, to be sure that there in fact were copies that could be preserved rather than simply on the internet, for example. Yeah, I mean, the reason I uh, released the latest uh, album that we'll probably talk about later, Acoustic no, Microtonal, uh, with a, a record label, part, it was partially because that made it more likely to survive long term, having it on a record label's catalogue. Um, so presumably that its lifespan will be longer than if it um, was just published on YouTube um, for example, for example, MySpace, all the music on MySpace is gone now. They just suddenly got rid of it. So so that's all gone. Oh, the tech companies aren't interested yeah. in preserving for history? That's a joke. I mean, I mean they're, they're, they're interested in money. So if that made the money, they would be interested in that. But I'm sure you can work out right. that's not. Right. It's interesting, like Brahms, we lost a lot of his music, in part because he destroyed it himself. Mm. So he, he was so critical. So it can happen. And maybe it was a great loss or maybe Brahms was a better judge of his own music than history would have been. Yeah, there's obviously uh, Sibelius's Eighth Symphony, which he had burnt um, on a fire. Um, that that was a big one. Um, and, and didn't somebody rescue those? So some, some fragments exist. Uh, um, they played them recently. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that you've, uh, done a lot of arranging, maybe composing for movies, TVs. Yeah, mainly arranging these days. It's a lot easier than composing. <laughs> so how exactly does that work? Like, does somebody compose a, a few lines and you take it from there? Or how does that work? I, I would compare it to, um, let's say you've got a theatre script, a play or a film script, and 
there's many different ways of um, creating that, turning it into a film. You give it a different director, different actors, etc. But like overall, it's you know you'd be able to tell it's the same thing by looking at different versions and arranging's a bit like that. I, I think so. Um, you have to have a degree of faithfulness to the original music, and then depending on the context, know how far you can sort of change that. Uh, so somebody may have written the entire score and you go from that? You're mainly adding strings and things or orchestrate it. It's a bit like orchestration, I guess, but maybe changing the harmony sometimes depending on the context. Um, I, I'm quite conservative, so I, I generally don't change harmonies um, too much. Have you ever had to conduct or be in the actual development of the soundtrack with the movie up on the screen and yeah i've conducted but it's not something i'm um i, I don't think it's a good idea for me to conduct my own arrangements because i'm sort of concentrating on not messing up rather than listening to you know the individual you know the violas see if the um it's a lot easier with um commercial music to conduct because you've got a click track you're wearing headphones so uh no one's going to get lost there's a screen with the um, bar number on etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, i normally have other people do that these these days but if if there's no op if i have to do it i'll do it but uh, only if i have to um i haven't studied conducting um but I, i'm giving comments in the stu in the studio um to remotely to the players so i'm still giving feedback just via the conductor so i'll tell the conductor you know that bar was bad or something then he'll convey that to the players overall do you enjoy that process less so recently it's very very stressful because a lot of money has been spent on these recording sessions so what i tend to enjoy more these days is editing the recordings afterwards where you know there's no time pressure and you can listen to every take and choose the best one and uh, that's why I, I i'm enjoying quite a lot when it's um when there's a lot of time then it's more enjoyable but when you've only got not very long um it, it's very stressful um because <laughs> you don't you don't because you, you know the price of a mistake is quite high in time wise um a, a mistake but a mistake by me not by them like if i if i've made a mistake and in the score or or something like that um i mean i mainly record in eastern europe so in budapest where the money is is less than it would be in the uk or america but it's still a lot of, it's still a lot of a lot of money um if that makes sense um yeah so the players are just incredible there um the uh the setup uh, i i mainly work with a company called uh, budapest scoring and they had um they they do the sessions remotely over zoom so you you they live stream the um you know the audio so you can hear them the conductor recording the music and then you talk to the conductor over zoom about the bits you want redone and they had this all set up before the pandemic and then when the pandemic happened this sort of turbocharged their uh, business because suddenly remote recordings were the only way you could get you could actually do it and they're, 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 they're really huge now they bought their own studio um, their own concert hall and things so you were doing the Blackwood music mm -hmm. is that how it was done were you actually there or were you zooming yeah i was zooming you know they they'd play it through and then i talk to them they talk amongst themselves uh sometimes they'd practice in the um recording session um yeah it was it was very it worked very well did you ever find a limitation because of the sound quality there is there is an issue with the sound quality uh when when it's at that sort of distance uh i remember one time uh, I did a recording session in LA over Zoom. And what you need to understand is that there are people there as well that can verify if it's good. So if, if something's really high and it, the quality isn't good, you can just ask the musicians or the um, the engineer, w was that okay? I couldn't tell. And that they'll um, they'll let you know. So that that's the sort of solution to that issue. But generally, it's uh, not, not so much as a, pro a problem. I think a couple of years ago, it would have been more of a problem than it is now. Uh, but the technology is sort of being sort of streamlined more these days. 
I'll often ask the musicians, "Are you happy?" Because yeah, because you know they want a good they want a good recording performance as well. So and sometimes they'll say, "Oh no, we want to do it again. We think we can do it better." Uh, so uh, there's a lot of trust involved, but um, th these guys are really really good, and um, if they're happy, then I'm happy normally. Yeah. When you did the Blackwood recording, was it a pickup orchestra or is it a an established recording orchestra? It's a it's an established recording orchestra, but they don't. Um, I think some of them work exclusively for the orchestra, but others are. Uh, so, so so yeah, it's it's mainly the same people. For example, the brass and wind players and the harpist. Uh, I think they're in the uh, Hungarian Hungarian Radio Symphony Orchestra. Five minutes of recording time with the entire orchestra. If you've got a very short piece of music and um, you share the session with many other composers, so the first twenty five minutes will be someone else, and then it will be you. Um, so th this is mainly their kind of business model, but they also do bespoke sessions like the the Blackwood with with fewer with fewer players. Sure. What's your goal for yourself it, with regard to composition? And I've sort of put it uh, pause my composition for a for a bit because I've been very busy, but I do want to start doing it again. But the arranging's really taking over, so I think my ambitions would be more in that field. Um, for sure, arranging and producing, uh, for sure. Arranging is a, a very comfortable, profitable thing for you. It's, it's not as uh, profitable as um, as composition, depending on what the composition is. Like a uh, composition for commercial music uh, can be very lucrative. I've done some of that, and there's also I do a lot of what's called trailerization. The trailerization is where you take a well-known song. And then you kind of recontextualize it for a film music trailer. And people, everyone knows this song and they know the lyrics. You don't have to have the lyrics. Uh, so a good example would be the song Smile by Charlie Chaplin, which is a really lovely song. But they use this song for the Joker because, you know, he's got a smile. And that's a kind of, you know, it's this really happy song, but it's to a sort of very dark movie. So they've kind of changed, they've recontextualized it. And this is a very sort of uh, trendy sort of new sort of... Um, approach that film trailers are taking these days so i've done uh several uh several trailerizations of um uh, songs from the catalog of my publisher bmg so they own the um the copyright to the music so every time it's played they get money so there's a sort of symbiotic relationship um uh, between us with regard to the blackwood CD. First, define microtonality. I can do it in three words if you want, but it might be offensive to microtonalists. Um, I guess out of tune would probably be the very easiest way of um, describing it. So these are notes that are not on the piano, or some of them are on the piano and some of them aren't. So on the piano, we have 12 notes. Um, most music is written using 12 notes, uh, the chromatic scale, 12 tone music, um, tonal music. But in um, other cultures, they use different notes. Uh, so most uh, non-Western cultures will use uh, what are called microto microtonal scales. But to them, our music would be microtonal because we're using notes that aren't on their scale. So there's, there's a sort of the, a lot of cultural sort of bias to what what we think of as um, non-standard uh, tuning. And there are many many types of um, microtonality and the one that i'm exploring or blackwood is exploring in this album is what's called equal temperament so equal temperament is where you divide the octave into equal amounts of parts so for example if you divide it into 12 we have the chromatic scale if we divide it into six we have the whole tone scale which is in um, six times two is 12 so that's still in our usual um system if you divide it into three you've got the augmented chords if you divide it into four you've got the um uh, diminished seventh now now we come on to numbers where if you divide it there are notes that aren't in the um 12 tone scale so for example if you divide it into five you get a sort of pentatonic scale but it's not exactly the same as the black notes on the piano this um division of the octave is uh, very popular in a lot of non-Western music, a lot of flutes play in this scale. Similarly for seven, if you divide the octave into seven, um, there's a lot of, for example, Thai music uses a similar scale. So if you divide it into seven, you don't have any modes anymore. So the, that 
the uh, seven notes equals scale is very similar to the whole tone scale. So with the whole tone scale, if you transpose it up a whole tone, you've got the same scale. It's the same with this. Uh, I hope there's not too much music theory here, but um, you can't avoid it sometimes. Now, Blackwood's exploring equal temperaments of notes more than 12. He's not so interested in the uh, five note equal, seven note equal, for example. So he's exploring divisions of the octave from 13 to 24. Now, uh, maybe a, a better way of explaining this would be to compare this to something that non-musicians uh, would be familiar with, which is uh, the, the clock. So with a clock, we've got 12 hours, don't we? Um, what if we had 13 hours on that clock? Or, you know, we've got 12 months in the year. What if we had 16 months in the year? What, what, would, what would that world be like? So let's say we've got 16 months in the year the seasons are still going to be the same length as they would be with 12 months in the year. So there's a similarity there, but with 13, there's no similarity at all. So th this is what Blackwood explores in the um, dividing the octave into um, uh, 16 notes. There's the diminished seventh chord is the same as the one in 12. So that's quite a big feature of that composition. But with 13 notes, there's just nothing in common at all. And that's a very strange alien sort of landscape. But uh, so Blackwood chooses a different uh, historical style for every single etude, the one which works best for the um, the music theory of that particular uh, microtonal scale. So you have Baroque music, for example, for the 21 divisions of the octave. Uh, you have sort of Skryabin, Stravins early Stravinsky for 18 notes. You got Schubert for um, 22 notes. For 23 notes, which is a prime number, so it has nothing in common with 12. He couldn't find anything in common at all with the 12 tone equal scale. So he looked to Balinese Gamelan and he uses the Slendro and the Pelog scale. Uh, so and then. Um, and then 17 notes and 19 notes, they're very similar to um, 12 notes in that they have diatonic scales. Uh, so that, that music is the most sort of normal sounding of all of them. Um, and the process that you used, as I understand it, is you had the players in different cubicles. Yeah, isolation booths. Yeah, they're in different soundproof rooms. Right. And so they played the music as close as they could with regular tuning and then you would go in and adjust that yeah that's that's partially true it's a bit more complicated than that but that's probably the easiest way to describe it um because rounding up every note to the nearest um 12 tone note wouldn't necessarily sound musical so i had to sort of do a lot of tweaking to i uh, to in order to get the expression the gestures i had to um uh, there was a lot of it's, it's a bit like translating into another language there's things that just don't work so if you're uh, you're translating into italian english nouns and you're writing a song and you want that to fit um there, there aren't any nouns in italian with with one syllable so you know this is a unsolvable problem and they were they were unsolvable problems um, in some of the uh translations um i i think a good way of describing it is so when Schoenberg um, invented his um, atonal music, the music sounds very radical, but under the hood, it's very the the orchestration, the gestures, the structure is very similar to um, late Romantic music by Brahms and uh, Wolf, uh, composers or, or early Schoenberg. So it's as though we had. If we turn Schoenberg's music into this late romantic music and then retuned it on the computer to 12 tone music, as in atonal music, in the early 20th century before people knew how to play this um, music, you would have got a better result than what early performances of Schoenberg. So we're in a similar sort of stage, perhaps with microtonal work, that maybe these pieces will be playable in the future, but this is the sort of uh, sort of stepping stone to to that to that sort of uh, maybe in a hundred years time the performers will have uh, this this will be playable for them. It seems to me that because you're trying, if you have to put it in Western notation, it's always going to be a problem of translating. Mm. And to some degree, Western musical notation works within its system, but may not work in other systems. 
What's interesting is some of it doesn't work within its system, and this isn't appreciated. So the system is based on um, seven letter names, but something like the whole tone scale or the octatonic scale, which have six uh, notes or eight notes, that th there's a lot of sort of problems notating those in the normal in the normal notation system. So that this isn't uh, this isn't just a problem with uh, microtonal notation system. So. Um, it's a bit more complicated um, than that, perhaps. Why did you choose his music? It's very, very good music. Very, very attractive. Very, uh, very thrilling. Very beautiful. Very, very well written. And uh, yeah, there's not actually many other alternatives uh, of of that quality. There's an album by Wendy Carlos called Beauty and the Beast, which is really good. Uh, but there, there's not as many uh, sort of large sort of collections of microtonal music that could be done in this way that I know of, at least. You you mentioned um, it sounds flat. It did, did portions of it sounded flat to me, but others of it, like there was a suite that sounded very Cooperanish, or um, mm, mm. It, which didn't sound flat. So I guess. It all depends on the piece and what the effect. Is They're all different. For. They're all different. Uh, that, that's that's the interesting thing about them. How long did it take you to do that? The whole the whole project it took about two and a half years, three years. Uh, basically, it was started at the beginning of the pandemic, and then the recording sessions were over the course of a year. Um, recorded the different instrumental uh, types in, uh, together, so strings in one session, winds in the next session, playing to the recorded strings, brass in the next question, in the next session, playing with the strings and the winds, and then finally harp. Um, wow. And how did you get hooked up with Sadil to get it recorded? Uh, they had an online submission form, uh, so I um, uh, su submitted, submitted it uh, via their online form, uh, and they, can, you know, they, they, they agreed to do it. Uh, well, if nothing else, it's generated a lot of interviews for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've got I've got a lot better at interviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you, you chose a, a good lot time. You chose a good time because I wasn't as I wasn't as good before. But I've got a webcam now. I've got a microphone. Um. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I'm sorry that we only have a minute left. Uh, it was great talking with you. Yeah, really great. Thanks so much. For a lot of me, uh, informa yeah. information packed into a little space. Absolutely. Hey, good talking with you. Take care of yourself. You too. Have a great day. You too. Mm, See ya. Bye bye. Thank you.